just to kind of recap where we've been. Uh, teacher voice. <laughs> so, um, you know, Gavin's given us a really good introduction and an overview of some paradigms that we're looking at for atonement. That was a couple of weeks ago. You'll remember the remains of last week still exist. <laughs> we took scripture. I remember one of the comments was, thank God we don't have to put this into a multiple choice exam. <laughs> which was actually my systematic theology experience. We had multiple choice exams on exactly that. So um, today we're going to switch. I think it's important to switch for just a little bit over to the individual level to begin to frame now because we're going to start to look more specifically at these three paradigms. And as you know, as we go through this uh, later, you're going to kind of take a position with one. So maybe if we're headed toward taking a position, it's good to have a baseline measure at the first point, you know, where, where am I on this? And you know already all answers are correct, so don't be intimidated by this at all. Uh, today, though, we look at the subjective or the human word, and we're going to look at moral transformation theory and liberation theory. But first, take just a moment here at a personal level and answer this question. When I look at a cross, I see. Uh, take a couple of minutes to get your idea, and then I'm going to ask you to share that with your neighbor if you'd be comfortable doing that. So take just a minute. And you'll recognize that cross, I think. <laughs> when I look at a cross, I see. Does everyone have a? Good, yeah. Take a second and share with somebody that you haven't talked with much today and share ideas. Hello, hello. You think what? It's a story. You think of a story? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so as you wind down, if each table could share an idea with the other two tables, if you'd be comfortable doing that in a minute. <laughs> Well, no, we'll just, we'll just share, we'll share all together. Yeah. yeah. We had resurrection, love, story, and we decided that all three of them fit together. Yeah, yeah, good. And then good. she was saying that, that in some churches he's shown as a king, like this one, and other churches, when he's on the crucifixion, he's shown in just this one cross as Truly yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, good. In, in the back, could you share a little bit from your table with the other two tables, if you'd be comfortable doing that? Um, so when I see a cross on the wall, I see the love and the 
Yeah. And so yeah. when I go places now, I collect crosses and I'm wearing one and I know it's going to be a good Yeah. What about your discussion at this table? What could you share? I uh, I was saying I, I see each one differently and that um, it's, to me, it's an artist interpretation um, because there's so many different ones out there. As Brian put it, you have. Abs Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't me originally. <laughs> but no, you, you have the human you have the human form suffering, you have um, uh, the king or godlike form. Um, some crosses are more ornate than others. Um, some are, are basic wooden beams. Um, and it's uh, I don't know if it's if, if it's the creator's Creator of the crosses, mood for the day, or the, the, the message they're trying to go for. But when I notice, the first thing I notice is how different every cross is. You're gonna love liberation theory. Then. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna love this day. This question yeah? is it geared toward the physical or the metaphysical yes. interpretation. Yes. <laughs> so if if so far in the series you've been kind of hmm and questioning some of, you know, how is this all going to go? It might not be uncommon that you'd come up with, well, you know, my God is a loving God, and if humans were created to be so evil, why do we need wrath? Why do we need a wrathful God? Or maybe you're thinking, well, if God required Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, this must be some kind of child abuse. Or maybe you're thinking, what happened to thou shalt not kill? Or even what happened to practice what you preach? Or, this is Sarah Moon, the result of Christ's death and resurrection is that we are free from our sins, though we still sin, and go to heaven when we die, maybe if we ask nicely. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have a couple of weeks before we really roll up our sleeves and, and wrestle through this as a group, but these, I think, are some of the questions that you want to be working through. And today, we take this approach. The cross of Jesus calls those of us who are oppressors, ouch, to humility, repentance, and a new way of living. <clears throat> so we're looking at two theories today. Uh, let's just make sure we understand the basics of each. And there's a handout here. I think Bob needs one. I'll walk one back here in just a second if you want to share. There are more copies up here, and I'll bring one back. But um, you've got a full like, you know, definition description on your handout, but let's just get some of the basics for these two theories. Um, moral transformation says Jesus Christ came and died in order to bring about a positive change to humanity. The death of Christ is understood then as a catalyst to reform society. So we follow the example and live a good moral life. The saving work of Jesus, not only in the event of the crucifixion, but also in all the words he spoke, the whole gospel, as opposed to what we wrote out last week. That's the example that we have set. So then the cross becomes a ramification of the moral life of Jesus. He's crucified as the martyr due to the radical nature of his moral example. So Jesus Christ as teacher, our example, our founder and leader, and ultimately the first martyr. This description's on your handout if you want to think about it some more later. But let's jump in and uh, look at some crosses, maybe crosses that you've never seen before. <clears throat> Let me give you the artist's description here. This is Mel Chen, Cross for the Unforgiven. It was done in 2002. Um, a work, oh no, uh, yeah, a work that the artist created um, and exhibited in a, um, an art show called Unloaded. And so this is eight cut and welded AK-47 rifles in the shape of the Maltese cross. 
So if these guns were still operational, and this is from the artist's statement, they would fire upon each other, alluding to the self-destructive cycles of violence and religion. So Mel Chen, the artist, also disarmed another kind of handgun for a different sculpture using the body of the gun to house a gunshot trauma kit complete with electronic locator, life-saving bandages, saline IV, and other medicines. So the work here vacillates between conceptual art and design as the sculpture could paradoxically both threaten life and save it. Moral transformation. So I don't think you've seen this uh, cross before, is my guess. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, I jumped you right into the deep end here with moral theory <laughs> and a type of cross. So if we go back and, and swim closer to the shallow end, what other ideas come to mind around a moral theology and the cross or atonement? If, Yeah, if we back up one, the death of Christ is understood as a catalyst to reform society. So yeah, um, what other reforms could take the place of the topic or subject of this cross? It's kind of brainstorming. You know, we're going to host an art event as a community event. What might be the theme of ours? So instead of gun... Uh, safety, gun violence, what might just off the top of your head be other topics that we might take on if we were moral transformation people? Inclusion, Inclusion. good. Or the victimization of people who are othered and are being make, bullied or killed be of it because of it. Similar to this, you could make a cross out of the razor wire they put up. Yeah, very good. Right, good. And I thought the other example that you'd mentioned first, um, the debt crisis in the U.S. and the help that we're doing this season to help people who are under overwhelming, oppressive medical debt. Yeah. Yeah, right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good. You've got your mind right in the game here. Let's switch over. <clears throat> And let's think liberation theology again. We're asking, you know, Gavin asked us to think about both of these in the same day, and you're going to notice quite a bit of parallel here. When we look at liberation theology, <clears throat> um, uh, as Christians, we're called to a discipleship that takes the crucified people down from their crosses. That's actually the title of the piece of Sobrino's um, kind of groundbreaking article that he wrote, Taking the Crucified Down from the Cross. So this approach refuse us, refuses to allow unjust structures like those that crucified Jesus that continue to put to death many who are considered economic, political, religious, and economic other. So we're called to get in the way of the death-dealing work of these structures of sin. We're called to practice mercy with and, and, and solidarity alongside members of crucified communities. So the text from Micah. Um, love justice, do mercy, walk humbly with your God. 
Um, so here, God takes a side in this approach. So not only does God side with the oppressed, but God also identifies as the oppressed. Jesus on the cross, crucified by an economic system like you were just talking about, the crucified by political elites for being inclusive. And so here's another cross. Slow me down if this gets overwhelming. <clears throat> the <laughs> it is kind of like one of those psychology things that you look at and they ask you if you see an old person or a young person. <laughs> Let me get my notes. Yeah, here we go. Now, um, this is from, if you want to go and explore these, the link is on the back, but this is from uh, artandtheology.org. And this is actually from the Stations of the Cross that was at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And the whole exhibit was ex uh, developed by Victoria Emily Jones. So this is called Requiem for Charleston. And, the, and they're tambourines. You maybe can't see that from where you're sitting. So they're tambourines that aren't making sound. They're commemorating people who were killed in Charleston in, uh, when was it, 2015, when a white supremacist entered the midweek prayer service at the Emmanuel African, American, or African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so nine people were shot um, in that uh, tragedy. So Requiem for Charleston, the nine people are the larger trampolines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the artist's technique, which you can't see from where you are, but you maybe want to look at this one at home because it's kind of interesting. The art technique has the name of the person on each tambourine on the head of it. And at the top one, you can kind of get just a little hint of it, but it's done in such a way that you're pulled into it. You're like, wait, what is that? And you're drawn to walk closer to it or at least to engage more. And then you can see that it's a name of a person. Um, so this is from um, the artist again. Some of the tambourines are left blank in memory of the many other people who've died in acts of racial violence against churches throughout history. Others are made of black acrylic discs that reflect the viewers' faces, reminding us that the Charleston mass shooting is a human tragedy we all share, one that demands collective mourning and collective assumption of responsibility. So the trampoline for this artist has a lot of personal significance. She grew up playing the instrument in her grandmother's church. So trampolines, uh, trampolines, tam tambourines. Tambourines are used in many churches as a form of expression in worship and in protest. In the black church, they are often provided the principal rhythmic driving force of the service. Here though, instead of jingling, the bells are still a silent tribute to the lives lost. I want to, are there reactions to this? I mean, that's kind of, that's really, really heavy. So maybe we should talk for a second. I think it's real is what we're being the experience of somewhere. Some bigger magnitude, some lesser. But we've, we've gotten absolutely uh, numb. Nobody, I mean, it, it's hard to even react. It's just a news cycle. And from the perspective of looking at this as a representation of cost, I wonder if both the way it was designed and its specific its specific reference to mass shooting, if it doesn't pull us in and engage with us in a more in a very modern and real way, almost a very general way, and force us to reconsider our place within cost and how we connect to it and how it's real in our daily life. Beautifully said, yes. Okay, Gavin, I think she's on my team. <laughs> I think it's incredibly saddening because like, as, a, as a kid, I probably don't have the knowledge that a lot of you guys have, but from my knowledge of being in you know, this church for a few years, and I absolutely love it, but I you know, worked a lot, love thy neighbors, you know, help the oppressed, 
and to see like the earth shattering reality that is not all people, like you said, representations of our cross don't share those same views and instead actively seek to hurt others that are different than them, it makes me incredibly saddening and it makes me kind of guilty knowing that there are people that, you know, aren't as kind, especially when that's the whole viewpoint of what our church stands for. Yeah, yeah. Um, you Yeah. You know, and that triggers other cycles and systems of oppression, not just within the family, but in social structures as well. Yeah, really good insight. Okay, you all are loving liberation theology. <laughs> Maybe the most prominent author is James Cone, and um, highly recommend this as um, I had to ask Mary Beth if this is already on your reading list yet, but this might be one option to consider in the future, the cross and the lynching tree. Um, James Cone takes the lynching tree, goes through the history of the United States with racism and the use of the lynching tree, and then pulls us in with a parallel between the lynching tree and the cross as a way uh, to liberate our thinking, <laughs> as a way to completely reorient our thinking. So he's saying here, you can see, um, salvation is available only through our solidarity with the crucified people around us. And he's saying then that God's word uh, presents for us a paradox, a mystery that we can't control or fully understand, a paradox because it's here and not here at the same time, it's revealed and not revealed at the same time. And he's saying that these types of, of uh, paradoxes are most evident in the cross a symbol of death and defeat, God turned it into a sign of liberation and new life. Um, it, it's hard to do justice to the significance of, of this book, but I would highly recommend digging into it deeper as an example of this, you know, if that's something that we wanted to do. But I don't think we can talk liberation theology without talking about James Cone for just a second. Um, so that's our nod to... to uh, James Cone. I want to jump into one last example here um, of Stations of the Cross. And this example is on your handout also. And I think it's a good one, um, you know, to walk through on your own. This is um, the work of, and I've misplaced my notes here all of a sudden. Oh, right here. This is the work of um, Adolfo Perez Esquivel, and he's from Argentina. Um, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate in 1980. And there's a whole set of all the stations. Again, you have the link and you can walk through it like at your computer. <clears throat> I didn't mention this. The other link, the art and theology piece, the curator has a description of each of the pieces in it. So it's kind of an interesting self-study. This one though, the words are right there for us. This is station 12. I guess by way of comparison, let's start with Station 12 that we prayed on Friday um, here at the church, the way of the cross, the 12th station, we prayed, the cross becomes a pulpit now. Forgive them, Father. You will be with me in paradise. There's your mother. There's your son. I thirst. It's complete. 
To speak, I have to raise myself by pressing on my wrists and feet, and every move engulfs me in new waves of agony. And then, when I've borne enough, have emptied my humanity, I let my mortal life depart. That was our twelfth station prayer. In this piece, you see already the theme is a reflection on how the world is ripped apart. And the description there, the whole world is crucified by the spirit of violence. Two halves, rich and poor, north and south, heaven and earth. They've been pulled asunder, yet still the cross is what unites them. It's love that hangs crucified, a love that transcends even tortured death. All who take risks and put their necks on the line for justice in this world stand here in solidarity. Amongst this communion of the saints are those powerless to do anything but testify with their powerful presence, the spirituality of the foot of the cross. Such often is our station. <clears throat> this um, artist and the person who's writing these reflections, who is from Scotland, uh, Alistair, I'll get his name here in a second, it just escaped me, but I want, to, I want to highlight his words on liberation theology here and its connection to mysticism or mystical experience. The curator of this series says that mystical experience is of central importance in liberation theology. So Jesus can be experienced in and with those who suffer. For those who have faith, the act of turning to the oppressed, of serving the poor, of search for freedom from exploitative, exploitative structures is also an act of love for the suffering Christ. By the same token, the resurrection will be experienced whenever life is defended. Furthermore, all life which is oppressed and extinguished by power is included in the resurrection. And that's the concept that this artist has throughout the piece and in his Easter picture, which I didn't get yet because that's like cheating if we get to go to Easter. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think the discussion now maybe goes back to um, how might we see the cross differently? And, and, you know, we had that, if we went all the way back, it's when I... When I look at a cross, I see. Um, take just a second and reflect on that and how you might write it if you put on the lens of a liberation theologist or a liberation uh, proponent or moral theorist. And of course, we always run a little bit short of time. But if you'd be comfortable sharing with somebody at your table what thought you're thinking now about how you might fill in that sentence, I think that might be a good exercise. And then each table could share if you want it again, like we did at the beginning. It'll be fun. It'll change your life forever. <laughs> just, just take a second, if you're comfortable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
lover, you have to learn who's behind it. You know, you kind of. No, I mean, just like your church and stuff. You know. It's, there's a lose it. It's losses to friendship. Right. Right. Okay, it's it's time then. One sentence or two sentence summary of your tables discussion. Could you take your tables discussion and turn it into one or two sentences that you could share with the other tables? I've got to get a teacher voice. Okay, folks, we got to wrap up. So if each table could give us one or two sentences from where you ended just now, if you'd be comfortable, um, kind of the heart of what you found most interesting. We came to, at first we were, she was thinking revolution, but then we came to empathy and inclusion because, because we're called to follow Christ, we're called to look at Christ as, as being so faithful that he had faith that he was coming back. Yeah. And if we're following Christ and trying to be like Christ, then we also have to have faith. And the inclusion, the inclusion that we're called to is to call people together. Yeah, nice. What about this table? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very good. What about your table? Wrap us up. Yeah, wow. Wow. That's a major pivot point. Yeah, yeah. Good work. We re revisit this in a couple of weeks, so so keep it churning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>